Well, good morning. Welcome to chapel. What an honor to be with you. What an honor to be here at New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary and Level College. I want you to know that I travel around a lot and it seems like everywhere I go, I meet somebody that went to school here and they are preaching the word, they are reaching the lost, they are making an impact in the church and for the kingdom. So I share that with you to encourage you. If you're a student, you made a good choice to come here. And if you're a professor, you're, what you're doing in the classroom is making an impact beyond what you could ever know. And if you're a staff member that serves students, I just want you to know that your work is not in vain. And I see the impact of this school and I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Dr. Dew, for the invitation. And thank you for your kindness, brother. Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for always taking my calls and answering my text. You are very generous with your time. Well, this Thursday is, uh, I think it's Thursday, the 31st is Halloween. And it's also the day that we tend to celebrate the Reformation. This year, the 507th anniversary of the day that Martin Luther posted his 95 Thesis in church door in Germany. So this week, we remember the movement that God brought about to recover some really important truths that God's word is the supreme standard, that we are justified by faith alone, in Christ alone, and God gets all the glory because he does all the work. But there's another lesson that came out of the Reformation that I want to draw our attention to this morning, the idea of semper reformanda, reformed and always reforming. Because we live in a fallen world and we are sinners, there's a constant need to rely on our th realign our thoughts and our actions with God's word. God's word doesn't change, doctrine doesn't change, but once a church recovers the word, they have to batter, battle to make sure that their thoughts and their actions and their doctrine continues to align with God's word given that we are fallen, given our propensity to drift. So we need to constantly realign our beliefs and our doctrine to God's word so that we don't drift, semper reformanda. And this is a biblical idea. We, we see this idea of ongoing realignment, I think, in Paul's words to Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, 16, when he says, keep a close watch on your life and on your doctrine or on the teaching we also see it in Article 5 of the Baptist Faith and Message on God, the Holy Spirit, and the work of the Spirit in our life, where it says that the Spirit leads believers into the fullness of the stature of Christ. And all of us are in that process as believers of sanctification. The idea of ongoing realignment is embedded in Paul's words to Timothy about the word, about scripture in 2 Timothy 3.16 when he says that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching and for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. This means we need teaching, we need reproof, we need correction, we need ongoing training in righteousness because God's gracious work of reformation is ongoing in our lives. And it's ongoing in the church. So with that said, there's in the book of Acts a story that I see as a Reformation story. A picture of the church in the process of Reformation. A guy with a teachable heart. And the result is that God gives him a powerful ministry. And that is my challenge to you today. My challenge to you today for all of us, is that we would have a teachable heart, that through that, God might bring about powerful gospel ministry. So let me invite you to turn to Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 29. We're gonna read a story about a guy called Apollos. We're gonna consider God's work in his life as we aspire to have teachable hearts. Let me read and then I'll pray. God's word says, now a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent man, competent in the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, 
He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he wished to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. When he arrived, he greatly helped those who through grace had believed, for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that the Christ was Jesus. Let's pray. God, as we turn our attention to your word, I pray that you would give us faith to believe unto obedience. God, give us the ability now to focus on your word and on what you would have us to learn and in the ways it applies. Lord, not generally, but to us and our lives and our circumstances. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, the first thing I want to point out is that this guy, Apollos, had a pretty impressive resume. Right, one of the things you do when you're in school is you develop a resume. This guy has an impressive ministry CV. It's hard to imagine someone who could top him. We learn in verse 24 that he was a Jew, so he has the religious background of you know, knowing the law and the prophets. And then we learn that Apollos was from a place called Alexandria. We would say he was cosmopolitan, city of Alexandria, founded by Alexander the Great, even featured a school of biblical interpretation. This is a, a world-class city, and as a school and as, as an institution in New Orleans, you, you live in a great city. You live in a city like this. I think Apollos would be very much at home here in New Orleans, a global city, a historic city, a place of culture. I mean, even Taylor Swift played here, I think, for three nights. So in addition to his urban, cosmopolitan, and cultured upbringing, he's described, it says, as eloquent, verse 24. He was an eloquent man. Used only one time in the Bible, this word paints a picture of Apollos as gifted with reason. In Apollos, we see a combination of reason and learning with biblical competency and theological conviction. And it says he was competent in the scriptures. He knew what he had of God's word. You could translate this as mighty in the scripture or strong in the scripture. Apollos is somebody who has both the gift of reason and the gift of learning. As Luke said, he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. That word instructed being the root from which we get our word catechized. Apollos was educated, he was trained, he was instructed. You could say he had some schooling. What's emerging is a picture of a person who seems to have it all. An impressive hometown, foundational education, and even sort of natural aptitude. And then, in addition to being all of these things, if you haven't already started to sort of hate this guy, Luke tells us that Apollos was fervent in spirit. This word fervent means Hot means boiling. We, I mean, we would say he was on fire. My four teenagers would say he was lit. But Apollo's fervency was rooted in theology. He was fervent in spirit, and he was speaking and teaching, it says, accurately, carefully, precisely, the things of Jesus. And here we have a model of the kind of spirit and truth ministry modeled by Jesus, commanded of his worshipers, and that's what we aim for in Christian education. Apollos was eloquent, fervent, reasonable, trained, and accurate. He defies what is the sort of modern Christian tendency to think that a person will either be fervent, hot for Jesus, or educated and theologically minded, as if this, these things were one of the or the other, but that's a false dichotomy. We see both of those in the life of Jesus, both of those in the life of Paul, both of those in the life of Apollos. In fact, what we see is that as a person grows in knowledge, they're growing in fervency. And this is this picture of orthodoxy, right doctrine, leading to orthopraxy, right living, leading to doxology, a life of worship unto Jesus, the King. But for all of his background advantages, talent and learning, Luke is careful for us not to make an idol of this guy. He's a fallen man just like us. 
And there were things he didn't know. There were ways that he needed to grow. And so we see in verse 25, it says he knew only the baptism of John. Commentators are divided on exactly what this means, but it it seems clear from Acts 19 verses 1 through 7 that while Apollos knew the gospel and he was a disciple of Jesus, he didn't fully understand Christian baptism and had not been baptized as a Christian. So the point is that there were gaps in his theology, things he didn't know. So this all comes to a head, we see, in verse 26 where it says he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. So to set the scene, Apollos, this eloquent and impressive disciple, is teaching in the synagogue. He's teaching publicly. His learning and natural talent are on full display. He gives his message. He's probably thinking, I nailed that. That was great. Then it says this this couple, we believe, Priscilla and Aquila, hear him And it says, in sort of poetic understatement, it simply says, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They took him aside and trained him to be more careful, more accurate. Now notice it says they took him aside. They didn't embarrass him. They didn't publicly want to shame him. This is is not cancel culture. No, they spotted a deficiency in him, in his teaching, something was off, and they took him aside, and in a more private, more informal setting, you know, go grab a cup of coffee sort of thing, they explained to him the way of God more accurately. The word accurate is mentioned in verse 25 and in verse 26. Apollos was accurate, but this godly couple's disciples him to be more accurate, and this is such a great description of the work of a Christian college or of a Christian seminary. We take students called by God, qualified and endorsed by a local church with natural gifting and various levels of knowledge and aptitude and accuracy, and together we grow in our gifting and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ to be more accurate. But I want you to see that Apollos is teachable He had what Jesus described as a teachable heart. Brothers and sisters, I just want to encourage you to be teachable. Be willing to be corrected by God's word in your personal life and in your church. God's going to bring people into your life, whether it's a professor or a spouse or a deacon in your church. And when they come with correction from God's word and wisdom from God's word, be teachable. Be humble. Be willing to listen. Really consider what they have to say. And this flows out of our doctrine of Scripture and out of our doctrine of the church and out of our doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And look, brothers and sisters, this process of growing and learning and sharpening and realigning is a lifelong process. Each of us, each of us has things to learn and ways to grow. And I know it's easy to say this and it's easy to hear this, But in the moment when someone approaches you in your church or in your home or in your dorm room or your classroom or the hallway, when you are corrected, things like pride and arrogance and sinful identity issues just sort of well up and you become unapproachable and uncorrectable. Paul Tripp says, he uses this phrase, he says, you lawyer up. You become your own defense attorney in the face of correction rather than listening and learning and repenting. And those sin responses not only dishonor the Lord, but they humble us. They humble us. I remember when I was in seminary, in my preaching class, the first preaching class I ever took, we, we had to do several sermons, and I preached my passage, and I sat down, and Professor Alex Montoya said, okay, class, what do you think about Mr. Groza? And they all said, oh, that was really good. That was great, you know, really good job. And then he said, okay, he said, okay. He said, "Uh, Adam, I think you did a good job in verses one through 10. He said, but the point of the passage was in verse 12. It was like, you completely missed it. And in that moment, it was God working in me, humility. God working in me, the ability to be corrected. And if if we're not humble and able to be teachable and corrected, it will harm 
your friendships. It will harm your marriage. It will harm your family. It will harm your church. It will harm the cause of Christ. But what we see in this passage, if that Christ will develop this in you, if you will commit yourself to this, that kind of humility, that kind of willingness to be teachable results in a ministry that will be more powerful. So finally, let's look at a powerful ministry. We see that what results from the, the school of, of Priscilla and Aquila is a more teachable heart and a more powerful ministry straight out of school. Verse 27, what does Apollos want to do? He wants to go on a mission trip. He wants to cross the sea, go to Achaia, preach the gospel. He says, all right, I've learned to be more careful, more accurate. Let's go tell somebody about Jesus. Education didn't damper his, dampen his fervency. It brightened his fervency. We also see the newfound accuracy doesn't cause Apollos to go it alone. He doesn't go rogue. He doesn't say, I don't need you. I'm going to do this by myself. No, it says he gets this education and then he goes, it says in verse 27, the brothers encouraged him and wrote the disciples to welcome him. So we could say Apollos was a churchman, a man of fellowship, a man of service. And then once he arrives, verse 27, he's a great helper to the believers. He's an educated servant. He didn't lose his fervency. Verse 28 says he powerfully refuted the Jews in public, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. And so as you grow in your accuracy, you're to grow in your fervency and obedience. So the story of Apollo starts with him teaching about Jesus, teaching the scriptures. And then he gets training, he gets instruction. He experienced realignment. He's a living picture of Semper Reformanda, the result is the good of the church, the spread of the gospel, and the bold proclamation of God's word. And this is a beautiful picture of the task of an elder in 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1, and it's, it's why we're here. Growth for kingdom impact, to more accurately learn the scriptures, to more faithfully proclaim the scriptures, to more faithfully live out the scriptures. It's interesting to note that when Paul writes to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1, he says, listen, don't identify with a human, identify with Jesus Christ, identify with our Lord and Savior. He says, some of you say I'm of a Paul, some of you say I'm of Peter, and some of you say I'm of Apollos. He says, don't do that. But think about that. Apollos was given a ministry by God with a kind of impact for Christ that caused people to put him in a category with the other apostles, even though he was not an apostle. All because Priscilla and Aquila were faithful to teach and Apollos was faithful to learn and go and the church expands to the glory of Jesus. So brothers and sisters, I hope that you will see this as a Reformation story. I hope that God will give you a teachable heart and I hope that the result of that teachable heart is a powerful ministry of bold gospel proclamation to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let me pray for us. God, we come before you and we ask this, that you would give us teachable hearts. We confess our pride, our arrogance, our ego, our tendency to lawyer up. And we ask God that you would continue your work of sanctification by the power of your spirit and the, and the, and the power of your word Lord, that through your sanctifying work in our life, we might have the humble mind of Christ to go and proclaim, not ourselves, but Jesus, Christ and him alone. We thank you, God, for the Reformation. May it continue. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.